beautiful yani sundar and what you understand by sundar is often beauty is we are not talking about bhayankar sundar we, we when we say sundar we are thinking about you know hills the uh, beautiful landscapes we are talking about beautiful flowers beautiful beautiful looking women and uh, that sort of thing pretty what we usually say pretty or we say cool now it's a, a in current lingo uh, awesome and stuff like that but uh, and and we assume that it's the modern art which uh, is responsible for making art not beautiful so i'm giving you an example for second century bc uh, second century ad that is uh, krishtabda dvitiya shatak and this is from gandhar area this is an image uh, not of usual buddha murtis that we get to see it is a starving buddha you know when he was meditating he he was he, he had a near death experience from where he decides that that is not the way i want to do it and majjhim pantha or the middle path is what buddhism is all about so don't punish your body unduly unnecessarily and this is a instance where he was punishing body to the extreme and uh, this was the moment chosen by the gandhar artist and gandhar art is peculiar because it is a place where the greek settled uh, and the indians were there so it was a confluence of two very different civilizational modes the hellenic civilization that is the greek civilization and the indic civilization and it was a melting pot and a meeting point of these two cultures and in that point of time you had these images there were some variations of this starving buddha image which is a very shockingly stark and it's by no stretch of imagination a beautiful image it's the it's the sculpture which is so beautiful so it is not the subject matter or the beauty of the subject matter which is what we often confuse you know people often meet artists and say oh mera ek gaon mein ghar hai uske piche pahad hai bada sundar jagah hai artiston ke liye to mujhe bhi khayal se bahut bad hai aapko aana chahiye wahan pe now artists can find a subject even in a rubbish dump you know they don't necessarily need to go to a place which is beautiful of course like everybody else we also enjoy being in a beautiful place so i have nothing against that but i'm just saying that as a subject matter it's not that artists are necessarily looking only for beauty because art is also about many other things it is also about giving you an experience a feel of even the unbeautiful things in life what matters is how you're presenting it you know so um that misconception um is not just a modernist thing it is uh, it has been tried out from you know centuries because this is something the extreme deprivation that a human body can suffer and what becomes the result of it is something that has always interested artists I mean, if you remember the jahangir painting of inayat khan dai you know jahangir actually sends his artist to to document this courtier his former courtier who was addicted to opium and was in his deathbed and what a wonderful drawing and a painting was produced and two of them these beautiful works dying inayat khan i'm not showing it today but if you ever get an opportunity you can also see it in the net uh inayat khan dying or dying inayat khan it's an absolutely wonderful and that is not a modern image of course when you come to the modern era you have examples like picasso you have examples like francis bacon uh, who's a very important 20th century british artist who is less known than picasso but very 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 important and picasso of course is dealing with emotional state of a woman crying when you cry you're not concerned about you know how beautiful it look unless you are a film star attending somebody's uh, funeral when you are actually quite conscious about how you look and how your selfie will look um, but by and large when somebody breaks down when is somebody's grief stricken jab shokahat log unke to beauty ke koi parwai nahi hota it's the emotion that comes through and bacon was a very tortured man so his own self portrait was also equally tortured um 
And then I go back to the 19th, late 19th century, August Roda, he chose, he did many beautiful girls and beautiful nudes and beautiful bodies. And he was so good at it that people often thought that he's actually using body casts. Uh, but this is a carving in marble, so it's impossible to use a body cast. But he chooses a man with a broken nose and it's one of his very well-known works. Now, why? You know, man with a broken nose is not obviously a good looking man. He's not a Greek hero. He's not a mythological character. He's not even a beauty of his time. So why a man with a broken nose? Because this man was known to him and he was a professional boxer. And he thought that, you know, his face is a very interesting, expressive face. And that's why he took it up. So this whole idea of beauty as prettiness is something. And this is another contemporary British artist called Jenny Savile. She does nudes and nudes which are hardly beautiful. They are like almost, uh, you know, meat shops where things are hung up and down and they're huge. They're they are like four times the human size in human scale. So you stand in front of them, they're gigantic nudes. They're anything but beautiful, but they shock you, they impress you. You can't take your eyes off them. So here the body is is thought of as something which is so intrinsically human. We are all given with a body and none of our bodies are perfect. So it is not an idealized human body. It is actually a very real human body painted with paint. So flesh, the, the paint becomes a substitute of flesh. And that is what this work is about. It's monumentality. It's how well the paint handles the flesh and the, and the whole play of scale and the in imperfections of the human body. It's, it's actually not about perfection. It is about imperfections. And this gives you a scale idea, you know. So this is the kind of scale these paintings are. They're all paintings, mind you. This is a, an installation shot from an exhibition of Jenny Savile. So art can be many things. It can be subversive, shocking, stunning, provocative, emotive, ironical, humorous. These are only a cursory list. There can be many more things and I can't possibly show you examples of everything today. But just keep this at the back of your mind that, you know, don't go to art looking only for a kind of superficial beauty or prettiness, then you will be sorely disappointed. So one of the myths that you need to bust first, perhaps, is this equation. Now, this is a work by a very well-known South African artist called Marlene Dumas. And she's very famous for her unconventional portraits. Now, these portraits is based on a, a photograph of somebody whom everybody knows. But this photograph was taken after the postmortem happened. So, um, this is, she's obviously dead and um, de-glamorized portrait of somebody who is absolutely the glamour quotient of her time. If I show you the next one, you will think, oh my God, it's the same person. But that is exactly what uh, an artist who's, who's kind of leaving an impact and saying something important does. You know, they are not often taken up by what everybody expects you to do, but does things which are unexpected of you so that it leaves an imprint. It, it changes the way we think of things, we accept things, we ex, uh, look at things. Now, who's this person? Whose uh, portrait is this? Uh, is, you know who she is, right? So this is exactly going in a different direction. It is glamorizing, super glamorizing. It's you know, adding another sense of gloss on top of what already exists. You know, already there is enough glamour. And this is a work by Andy Warhol. So he's again pushing it to, or rather pushed it to another extreme. But that's what I'm saying. So if you say that all art is like Marlene Dumas, no, of course not. But all art is not like Andy Warhol either. Um, so you have these uh, difficulties of defining what is what it is. So a good artist, remember, uh, make rules. They don't follow rules. They may understand rules, but what ultimately happens in great art is that it it challenges existing rules, expectations of the society of what is expected of them, and hence cut new paths, which allows you to read the world in different ways. Um, this is a sort of a contemporary Chinese artist who does all these happy, smiley figures, no matter what, you know, these are being shot at. But shot at is also 
a make believe thing because there's no guns they're pretending and everybody seems to have this face which is like a mask they're perpetually laughing so it is in a way a very subversive comment on the political uh, state of china where you know you don't really have uh, any freedom of expression uh, and uh, what is the artist trying to say you 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 are left wondering so there is an ambiguity it is is it a political statement is it a social statement is it just a funny picture which you know where everybody is laughing but then you know the laughter seems to be frozen the laughter is not um, spontaneous it seems like everybody is wearing the same mask so in minju Uh, and this is another spanish artist called maurizio catalan and he does these uh, very intricate very realistic uh, three dimensional sculptures which are which borrows the technique from adam tussauds everybody knows about madam tussauds na jab se amitabh bachchan ka murti wahan lagaya tab se so this was again a museum in london which has all the celebrities ka portraits in three dimension in wax and um, all kinds of very cutting edge materials so it looks like they are real you can go and stand next to them and take a picture of yours so maurizio catalan does a little bit of distortion but he uses the same technique and he does himself and he makes him a uh, place in very weird kind of places this was a placement in a gallery where he seems to be appearing like a bank robber who has dug a tunnel under the gallery and suddenly found himself uh, in in a in a gallery space so it is kind of funny it is also very subversive um these are just some examples and this is another work um, which i thought you would enjoy very much it's a book by bajju sham who's a gond artist who was taken to london by tara books for some workshops and he came back and he produced a series of drawings which was his impression of the city of london now you think you know he's a tribal he's been taken to london one of the first world cities one of the most glitzy glamorous cities and he would be overwhelmed but he was he came back and said that ye mera gaon jaisa hi hai magar thoda bada hai aur you know thoda modern hai magar um so he made this comparative book where he on one side would be an image from his village and the other side something that he found parallel in in london and this is an iconic image that was printed in the cover so he did pub crawling and he he painted a tree in the village with all the bats hanging from there and made a comparison between the arudias in the village and the arudias in in london and stuff like that it's a very funny um also very humorous book but the cover i think uh, uh, kind of uh, is the nutshell says it all that who keeps the time in a village a cockerel right and who keeps the time in london the big ben so you conflate these two things and you get this wonderful image of a cockerel extended from um the big ben thank you um <clears throat> so um so that's what i was saying in the very beginning that uh, the artists from the tribes themselves are doing great work so i think their services should be used for uh, making books and uh, some of them are being used but going back to aaj ki vishay it art can also be all these things and many more i will show you one example ek political ka to dikhaya ek कंट्रोवर्शियल का भी मैं दिखाता हूँ एक स्पेक्टेक्युलर दिखाता हूँ हर चीज का तो नहीं दिखा पाऊंगा बट यू गेट द ड्रिफ्ट दिस इज अ वर्क कॉल्ड क्लाउड गेट बाय अनिश कपूर व्हिच वाज अ पब्लिक स्कल्पचर इंस्टॉल्ड इन अ पब्लिक गार्डन इन शिकागो एंड एवर सिंस इट्स इंस्टॉल्ड इट हैज बिकम द आइकॉनिक रिप्रेजेंटेटिव ऑफ the city of chicago like you associate the big ben with london you associate victoria memorial with kolkata or you associate qutub minar with delhi or you associate um, you know the eiffel tower with paris this has become sheher ka pehchan uh, the landmark of the city that everybody flocks to and it's a bean shaped thing made of polished mirror polished stainless steel and it's well made so well that you don't see a single joint it looks like sambu it's pub bits produced itself or it's something that has landed from the outer space because none of the joints rivets nothing is seen it's so perfect apparently 
and it reflects the surroundings. So, and it sort of reflects it in a distorted way, but it reflects the sky. So it keeps changing with the light in the sky. Din me, sube, dopar ko, sham ko, depending on the season, the sculpture is constantly evolving and changing, and people just love it. But it is also huge in scale, and it feels like it's not even man-made. It is something, you know, the fact that it's made in a factory is hidden so well that it looks so perfect that it feels like it has always been there, you know. And that is perhaps an example of what art can be, a spectacular art can be. You know, obviously not all art is about spectacle. Uh, art has other things to do. This is Atul Dodia's self-portrait called the Bombay Buccaneer. And the Buccaneers, as you know, are pirates, basically. And he's kind of posing as James Bond 007. My name is Bond, James Bond. You know, that famous statement in every James Bond film that you see. And an iconic thing. And he kind of imagines himself as a James Bond. So there is a reference to Bollywood. The whole painting is devised like a clapboard, which is used in film shoot. You see this uh, clapboard thing on the top left. Two artists are reflected in his glasses. One is David Hockney, a very British artist, a very well known British artist. The other is Bupen Kakkar. And there are in the background, you see references of from their painting, Bupin's and uh, Hockney's. And um, self-confessedly, Atul is very taken by popular culture. So he was actually inspired by something that I'm sure all of you would recognize. So see how many layers are there, you know, how many references are there. This is a work by uh, an American conceptual feminist artist, Barbara Kruger, and it takes, uh, it sort of distorts a very famous saying by a 19th century French philosopher, Rene Descartes, who said, I think, therefore I am, defining why I'm human the major thing that he says differentiates us from other species is that we think. Now, in a consumerist society, more than you think, you are, you're defined by what you buy, what you shop, what you wear, how you present yourself. So it's a very ironic statement that I think, therefore I am, changes into I shop, therefore I am. And this is very uh, classic Barbara Kruger. This is strategy. She has worked repeatedly. She uses the language of advertisement. She uses this very bold white lettering on red and the black and white, very grainy image that is also taken from the popular magazine or newspaper or something which is already in circulation. So in that sense, except for tweaking the, the text, nothing is of her own making it's what she does is put these two three things from different sources together and makes a statement a political statement and also builds an aesthetics around it uh yeah this is a work by a man called abhijit uh, gupta he died some years back he was very young uh, died of a mysterious illness but this was during the celebration of the 150 years of Rabindranath Tagore, you know, the whole country was going crazy and the central government was giving money to anybody and everybody who did anything and everything in, with the name Rabindranath Tagore uh, attached to it. So it became a bit of a free for all. And he came up with this work where he uses a Rabindranath image from a calendar. And then on that, he is Salma Chumki, Sequins, Vequins, Bithake, Joham, Jaise Ghar Pe. Dev Devi ka puja room mein karte hain na, saadi pehna dete hain, tika laga dete hain, decoration kar dete hain, bulb laga dete hain, kuch LED lamps laga dete hain. Waisa hi unho ne, you know, he kind of did a reference to that. Or text jo likha tha, that is also a famous quote. I don't know if your generation people know about it, but in my generation, everybody could recognize that this is a quote from Sholay. Is a very iconic dialogue of that film. Now, it has again 
is a, it's, it created a huge controversy. Tagore Afikonados felt that he's showing disrespect to Tagore, but that's not the purpose. The whole idea was to sort of, first of all, make light of this whole celebration thing that was going a little over the top uh, in the 150th year and everybody who hasn't read a line of Tagore or seen anything by Tagore except for the national song and national anthem um, just went overboard to do something because you know there is money available so in a way it's the critique of that that everybody's jumping into this bandwagon without actually trying to understand what Tagore stood for what his philosophy was and what, what he did throughout his life also on the other hand it is um, it's also a statement that Tagore is somebody who had a middle touch, no matter what he did, he, he turned that into gold. So whether he was writing poetry, whether he's writing essays, whether he was a novelist, whether he was a songwriter, whether he was painting, whether he was building institution, whether he was a public intellectual, you know, so any, any robe that he donned in his life, he did it so well that he almost set a benchmark that this is the level that one should strive to achieve. So, you know, honestly, and anybody can say, Ki, you know, you, I wish I had those touch, that, that touch of the world. So on one hand, it is a very sincere, serious plea. On the other, it is kind of couched in a language which is very popular and which, if you bhakti bhav kuch jada hai, to aapko lagega ki shayad ye asamman kar rahe hai usko. Uh, which is not the purpose, you know, it's, it's ironical, it's humorous, but it's also something that states the truth. And a, talking about controversial, this is a minor controversy that it, it created amongst the aficionados, but there are instances we have seen in our country where artworks have fueled major controversies. A core example, Bad Me Hai, Me Wo Share Karunga, Aap Nungo Ke Saad, Abhi Chalte Hai Aage, to myth number two. ये दूसरा मित क्या है? That art is a set of skills. अगर आपके पास skill नहीं है, तो art भी नहीं है. और skill को हम कैसे define करते हैं? कि जो जितना realistic हो कर सकता है, वो उतना skilled है, जिससे नहीं होता है, वो skill नहीं है. So that is a very simplistic definition of skill and I don't think ये, ये हिसाब से हम ज़्यादा दूर जा पाएंगे. Good drawing versus bad drawing. हम, how do you decide? Correct versus incorrect. How do you decide? Is it more realistic, is necessarily better than less, less realistic? Is it so simple? Is it so black and white? But it's not. It's always very nuanced. It is depending on context. Now, kis ka context? This is a work by Bikash Bhattacharya, who was an extremely skilled painter in the realistic language. He does not use photographs in this. You know, he could do these kinds of things by looking, by sketching. And it's, of course, there is something very, very moving. And throughout his life, he dealt with these subjects of middle class, lower middle class, Calcutta, and their kind of fantasies. So sometimes they become very surreal. One of the tropes that he used regularly was blurring the eyes, so you can't really identify, and yet you had a feeling that you know this person. And there is also a layer of you know, but you don't really know, kind of back and forth that ambiguity is there but as far as skill is concerned you can't question that you know by any standards he's obviously a very skillful painter and you have Bhupen Kakkar from Gujarat who became a very internationally well known who came to art more or less self-taught did study art history for a while but you know and then he became he's kind of a it's a naive kind of a language. So now imagine if Bhupen's figure ko aap idhar ap daloge. Will it work? It won't work in Bhupen's world because Bhupen manages to successfully create a world. Now if you say that Bhupen cannot draw half as well as Bikash, so hence Bhupen is a bad artist and Bikash is a good artist, I don't think that argument will hold. Because what Bhupen manages to do, irrespective of how well he draws or how well he doesn't draw, he manages to create a world which is self-contained, which exists there and is very convincing because he uses a space which is also much more formal, much more schematic, where little bits of life seen as, uh, you know, snippets of life are added. So it's almost like a border that makes uh, this man, frame the man. And what is it called? man with a bouquet of plastic flowers, not just bouquet of flowers, but plastic flowers. He's kind of underlining the fact that this is a kind of taste that you 
really look down upon you think who who carries a bouquet of plastic flowers for a gift you know no self respecting person will give to you with a bouquet of plastic flowers they rather give to you with but there are people who kind of enjoy that aesthetics you know you think they're garish they're they're kitschy they're glitzy they're their manifestation of bad taste unka taste kitna kharab hai hum bolte hain so he actually does that he celebrates that bad taste so he became an artist to celebrate bad taste and for the first time somebody in india has done it and so much of it is actually indicative of class of caste of of uh, economic status uh, and these were the people that bupen was m- most comfortable and he did it and he did it with such conviction that it didn't matter whether he could draw academically well or he could do draw like a photograph he couldn't obviously he couldn't but that was not a handicap in his work that became the strength of his work or uh, take this man you know he was a refugee yeah. from pakistan you know he made this biggest public garden the rock garden by nek chand in chandigarh today it is one of the biggest draw for the city of chandigarh there are two things that take bring people from the world over one is le corbusier's architecture and urban planning and the other is nek chand's rock garden now this guy obviously had no training in art or sculpture and he just started building it on uh, just by himself in some corner in a jungle malaria is infested jungle and he was just a helper and assistant to a contractor who used all the thrown away materials to begin his work recycled materials through and through Uh, bags of cement which were you know kharab ho gaya tha then broken crockery so lohe ka rod salians so these so now where do you place him i mean do you think that he doesn't have any skill obviously he has great skill otherwise these things could not be made or you saw the worldly artists that i took references from now they can't draw like because what is area but if that is the only criteria we go by that that is the kind of skill that everybody should have that is then these guys will will fail it's like asking a fish to prove that he is a good fish by climbing a tree you know so uh, so that's the point i'm trying to make or or you know take this what is it a bicycle seat and a handle but it reminds you of a bull's head and it's a work by pablo picasso so you take a look at this and think eh to koi bachcha bhi kar sakta hai you know my bhanja can do this yes they can but he, they don't you know this is what the great artists do they make you see things which will change the perception abhi ye kaam dekhne ke baad is very difficult to go back to cycle seat and a handlebar and see them as just that you know so this is what art does it changes the way you look at things it's very common place very simple very cheap material think about um the the cloud gate and how much money was needed and how many people were engaged in this and that spectacle and that is art and he's made a great spectacle so this is also art which doesn't require anybody but yourself in your imagination so now i uh, do you so easily say that oh no that involves more skill so that is greater art than this we can't do that so we will have to go to art with a certain humbleness rather than our preconceived ideas uh, that we often take to art and get disappointed now we come to myth number 3 that there is a correct way of visual representation and all other ways are incorrect which is very much related to this and that also is a false belief because there are many many ways of visual representation there are as many ways of visual representation as there are artists that applies to art to design to to illustration to everything now look at this william calf 17th century dutch painter who you know used the qualities of oil paint to the hilt and oil paint was favored because it is so easy to depict i mean it made it possible you can't do this in tempera you that was the chosen medium of art in europe before oil paint was invented and oil paint became such a hot favorite of artists because the whole idea was to represent it more and more realistically and i mean here you know the lobster you can feel like you can touch the lobster you see that carpet 
that part of the stilla you think you can touch the carpet and it has a soft feel you look at the peel of the fruit you look at the glass you look at the wine in the glass you look at the silverware everything the surface of it the material how light reflects on different surfaces is done so well that you think you can touch it it cheats the eye what the french called the trompe l'oeil or the triumph of the eye matlab aankhon ki jeet तो सबसे बढ़िया सबसे आगे जो आ जाते हैं वो ये इल्यूजन दैट आंख ही सबसे आगे है और इफ इफ द आई कैन चीट यू इफ यू इफ दे दे मेक यू फील दैट दैट इज रियल एंड यू 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 आर टेम्प्टेड टू टच इट देन यू नो इट्स ऑब्वियसली वेरी हाईली स्किल एंड दैट इज द द एपिटोमी ऑफ यू नो एनी स्किल दैट यू कैन थिंक ऑफ एंड कंपेयर दैट विद दिस चाइनीज वर्क कॉल्ड सिक्स पर सिमनोन छे फल ऑल ब्लैक एंड व्हाइट ऑल इन टोन्स ऑफ व्हाइट टू ग्रे टू ब्लैक ओके मिनिमल टचेस आप शायद हाइकू के बारे में सुने होंगे इट्स अ वेरी शॉर्ट फॉर्म ऑफ जापानीज पोएट्री व्हिच एक्स टॉक्स अबाउट वेरी बिग एक्सपीरियंसेस बट इन वेरी वेरी फ्यू वर्ड्स एंड इट्स लाइक अ विजुअल इसके पीछे फिलोसॉफी है जेन फिलोसॉफी है क्या है फलाना दिखना आई एम नॉट गोइंग इन टू दैट बट जस्ट लुक एट द इमेज एंड सी दैट दिस इज थर्टीन सेंचुरी एंड दैट इज सेवेंटीन सेंचुरी नाउ टू से दैट ओनली द वर्क्स विच आर हाईली स्किल्ड आर गुड आर्ट एंड वर्क्स नाउ दिस रिक्वायर्स अ डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ स्किल इट रिक्वायर्स अ मेडिटेटिव स्किल इट रिक्वायर्स यू टू नो एग्जैक्टली हाउ लिटिल विल कन्वे हाउ मच so on one hand you have where everything is spelled out on the other you have something which has a lot of poetic restraint jo kam bol rahe hain par uska impact bahut gehra ho raha hai so you know so those kind of easy equations that we often take to art is highly questionable and i think as creative people we should discard this in the very first go and uh, try to see the work in its own merit or picasso's uh, this painting as it's a still life which includes the jus for journal which means a uh, newspaper in french then there's a guitar there is a candelabra there's a candle stand there is a a chair reference register reference is in this uh, um collage of actual woven uh, chair seat even the frame is done with a rope and this is very interesting because till then uh, we treated oil painting or canvas painting as a window you know ye window se aap andar dekh rahe ho ya andar se aap bahar se andar dekh rahe ho ya andar se bahar dekh rahe ho or as a mirror which reflects reality and there is a certain kind of a space construction though we know that it's a flat surface we treat it as a as a box space which goes in and here all that is discarded all that is thrown out of the window and here the artist is saying that don't treat it as a window don't treat it as a mirror it is not a, a window or a mirror it is paint on a surface and it's an object in itself it it has references to things that we know we see but it's not the job of an artist to exactly represent what to see it's the job of an artist to actually recreate our in our experiences in a different form and give you something new and that's why cubism uh, remains such a very important art movement in the history of, of 20th century because it questioned the very fundamental basis of how we treat art as a space which is like a box or like a stage is ke aage hai beech mein hai piche hai middle ground foreground background aisa hi हमेशा हम देखते रहते हैं दिस काइंड ऑफ सडनली शेक्स यू अप एंड सेज वेल दैट्स नॉट द ओनली वे यू कैन लुक एट इट लाइक एन ऑब्जेक्ट दैट दिस इट सेल्फ इज इज नाइदर अ गिटार नॉर अ रिप्रेजेंटेशन ऑफ अ न्यूज पेपर नॉर इज इट अ चेयर इट इज अ पेंटिंग अबाउट वेयर दीज थिंग्स आर पार्ट ऑफ इट बट इट इज नॉट ट्राइंग टू रेप्लीकेट अ कॉपी और ट्राई टू गिव द इल्यूजन दैट दिस इज इट so i'm not actually painting the newspaper as the newspaper we all know it but there is a reference to it and you make 2 plus 2 so your your intellect your brain your experience all that your perceptive knowledge all that comes into the play or or lisa milre she is much later she is from the 1990s and she does these 
which can be seen as a window display of bulbs. So there's no sense of depth. It's very flat. It's a very short kind of depth, if at all. It's like almost bulbs are displayed in a, in a shop window. And that is also possible that, you know, you don't have any necessarily foreground, background, middle ground kind of thing. Everything is up on the surface. So I'm just showing that there are different ways of doing uh, the thing. And it's very difficult to take one yardstick and say, I measure with this or this is fit this is not good art. It's not quite that simple. Ab chale myth char ki or um, so that is another thing that artists they can just sit and imagine and invent things off their head you know they are all born with creativity so jake bithado hatme pencil or paper de do and they will do something and that will be creative. But creativity actually needs a lot of inputs. And without that, it doesn't happen. Even images that we, we accept as always been there actually has a precedence and a history. This image, everybody knows, right? Saraswati. But was Saraswati always like this? Wearing a gold border sari? Sitting on a patthar, playing the veena, or piche landscape dikh raha hai, dood pe chand dukh raha hai, moor hai, swans hai. No, na? No? I mean, the headgear also, was it always like this? No. So what is the source? 19th century, Ravi Varma painting, which became so hugely popular that we started identifying the manner in which he showed Saraswati as the only way that Saraswati can be depicted. But that's not the case. There is a long history of the image and we forgot that in the last hundred years, we thought that, no, this is the only way that is how we can show a Saraswati. That we forgot that there is a wonderful Swalanki dynasty ka ye Saraswati hai aur hajar aapko image mein dikha so. You know, where the Saraswati is barely dressed and your Saraswati mantra may be, you know, there is celebration of a body, of a breast, of the ornaments and stuff like that. So anybody who knows those mantras would know that how sensuously the goddess is depicted in terms of a beautiful maiden. So obviously they were not conceiving her of somebody who's ripped top to bottom in a white sari looking very shuddhang pavitrang sitting with a veena in a landscape which looks like a jatra set, right? So an artist who went back to these images, which is Hussein faced a lot of flack from all kinds of people saying that, you know, he's showing disrespect because, you know, he's a non-Hindu. He doesn't care about Hindu deities. That is such rubbish because here is somebody who is actually trying to take away all these layers and layers of cultural reading and meaning and go to the essence of what is the essence of Saraswati. Besides, this is not an image which is meant for worship. This is not an image which is meant for a mandir. This is not an image which you will keep in your puja room. It is just an artist interpretation of what it me what Saraswati means to him. So that controversy was completely misplaced, partly because of the misreading that we do that images of gods and goddesses are again swambu. No, it is somebody's imagination, but it becomes popular and accepted. That doesn't mean that that's the only possible conceivable way of imagining a god. I mean, nobody has, nobody in Buddha's lifetime has made a visual record of what Buddha looked like. Same with Jesus Christ. So all the images of Buddha or Jesus Christ or whomsoever you see, thankfully in Muhammad's time, there was a ban that, you know, you, you cannot depict Muhammad in a human anthropomorphic form. But even then, Persian artists have attempted painting Muhammad, only his face is covered with a rumal. But there are scenes where he's riding a burak, going to heaven and stuff. Yeah. But, so it is always the imagination of artists. I mean, what is this anthropomorphic gods and goddesses that we look at? Who imagined them? It is not the gods themselves who have given that image, although that is what some people would like to believe, but it's actually 
made by artists and creative people. And they have changed according to the taste of the time, the demands of the society, and of course the powers that control that who could worship, what can be worshipped, what cannot be worshipped. So there is, if you see, there is not only the society, uh, there is finance involved, there is politics involved, there is anything but religion, you know. So it's not just all about religion and bhakti. There are many other things that come into play when it comes to creating an image which if you think is an image of a god. You know, one of the, one of the things that uh, Jangar Singh Sham did, and he was very interesting because he basically started the painting tradition of the Gonds that we now know as the Gond painting tradition. 50 years ago, there was no Gon painting tradition. The Gons had a tradition of music. Uh, the Pardhan tribe was known to be the bards. They would sing the stories of the gods and goddesses, which they saw in trees, in stones, in mountains, in the sky. But there was no anthropomorphic representation of the gods. So the first thing Jangar did when he started working was to imagine what the gods looked like. You know, and that was in a way the beginning of his painterly career. And from there sprang this whole tradition. Now there are some hundred people engaged in that. Uh, the, and we know it as Gon tradition. And there was no tradition before Jangar Singh Sham of painting. They had design traditions. They, they had musical traditions. But they no, didn't really, really have a painting tradition. Which is very interesting. But anyway... Um, that is something we can discuss some other time. Uh, today we will get on with this. And this is um, Francis Newton Souza. And people often think that, you know, people are constantly doing to Hindus. You know, they don't do it to their gods. That's not true. This is uh, a work. And he was a born Catholic who lived in Goa for the first half of his life. Thankfully, then he, he lived abroad, mostly in Europe, in England, uh, part of it. And uh, he was very upset because he had a very strict and hypocritical priest whom he associated with the religion. So he was not necessarily anti-religious. I think he gave up religion after a point. But he wasn't doing these images as a critique of Christ or the Christianity. It was also, you know, something to do with his angst of growing up with these images which he found very violent of the crucifixion of Christ and seeing that in the name of you know the supreme sacrifice of Christ people who were the priest class professing Christianity were doing exactly the opposite and so in a way these works are also his critique of Christianity but you think it's Francis Newton Sousa did it for his own thing and he was like a complete uh, nobody should be really fine because you know you can ne never do this with an image of a god then think again you know this is an image from 16th century by a very very respected artist you know, of the german descent called matthias grunewald this is a very iconic work in the history of medieval painting the isenheim altarpiece it was made for a small church which was part of a hospice. The hospice was for treating patients with skin diseases, where people who were suffering from skin diseases would come and pray. And this is not your smooth skin, beautiful, um, blonde haired Christ at all. It's a tortured body of a man who's been there in the cross, whose body is lacerated with lots of wounds and marks. If you go close and you can see how unbeautiful that skin is painted. And this is your Lord who's basically suffered the same fate. So imagine how powerful the emotional impact of that will be on people in the medieval era who have probably no hope of getting a cure, uh, suffering from terrible skin diseases who were confined to that hospice, going to pray to their Lord in that little chapel, which is part of the hospice and see that their Lord himself has suffered like they are having you know, it give, must have given them a lot of comfort. So, you know, if you look at it out of context now, go back to that image, it is anything but a very powerfully ugly image which talks about, you know, the decay of the human skin. And yet, to the people who were sufferers themselves, this must have been a very spiritually powerful image. 
So the context in which the work exists is also equally important. And without that, the chances of, of misreading or completely not getting it is very high. And the last myth is that the meaning of work is very linear. Now everybody can read this, like right? there's an I, there's a B and there's an M, IBM. It's a logo which was used by IBM, the famous well-known computer company for quite a while. And this is a very interesting piece of graphic design and visual communication where the meaning is conveyed in one go. You'll have a look at it. And if you know, you would make two plus two and you can read it. It's a kind of pictograph plus a one word. So, you know, it's easy to read it. And yet it's a very strong design um, liked by many people and very, very popular. It was appreciated. But a painting or a work of art also communicates visually, but the communication does not happen in um, necessarily in a linear way. You know, it's not so direct that you can just look at an image and decode it like you can decode this image. But IBM stands for this, it's a company, and you know what the company stands for. So in a way, the image gets etched in your head. Whereas a painted image often has many layered meanings, and I'm sharing a work by Abu Nijanath done in 1936. He did the series on the Arabian Nights. He stopped painting before that. He was writing for children for a while. Because we all associate Abu Nijanath with his early works of last days of Shah Jahan or Bharat Mata and all the rest of it. And he's moved away from that. Now he's a storyteller. He's telling stories. And this would have been an excellent illustration had it been printed, but it wasn't. It was done and then shown in one or two exhibitions and then it was lying in some trunk in some godforsaken collection which was ran by some lawyers who had no idea what they're sitting on. Finally, it has been discovered and displayed and the collection has gone to Victoria Memorial Hall Museum. So now, you know, there is a good chance and Arshiv Kumar has published a big fat book on Abhinindranath's late works where this is very prominently displayed. But this is a story of the Fakir and the Fishbone. It's called the Old Man and the Fishbone story. So this is the story of a man who comes to visit this uh, tailor couple and then he chokes on the fishbone, he dies at their place and then there is this whole history and um, politics of how to dispose of the body because they didn't want to be seen as the ones because they thought that the Sultan would think that they are the ones who murdered this man and blah, blah, blah. So they pass the body to the next door neighbor and the neighbor passes it on the next door neighbor. Like all, all of these sort of story within stories that are very typical of the narrative style of um, the thousand and one nights or what we know as Arabian nights. Uh, and then it goes from one story to another because Sherzad Zay has, uh, Sherzade has to keep telling stories to save herself from being killed by the man she was married to. The whole idea was that the stories will have to flow non-stop. So anyway, that's the, that's the story. But what does Abu Nindranath does with it? He, he takes Baghdad of Khalifa Harun al-Rashid and transports the whole thing into late 19th century Kolkata. Kolkata of his time, of his childhood, um, he grew up swing the signage like Kertegor and Company, which is the first in the British joint venture started by his own grandfather, who was, um, there was this equal partnership between an Indian and his own grandfather, that is Devendranath's father, Prince Dwarkanath Tagore. He was a vast empire of tea estate it's of um, you know opium trade of um, shipping lines and coal mines and, you know he was the tata of his day and he was actually the first indian to get into a 50 50 partnership business so in a way if you look at the history of indian industry Kurtagore and company is a very important company but by the time this painting was made that company was more or less gone losses but there was still a signboard that he he grew up watching of Kartagore. So he incorporates that. And the, the so lower, and it's kind of in bands. It is what horizontal bands. So the lowest band has some Muslim tradesman. There is some upcountry, the North Indian trader with a typical uh, uh, Gandhi cap, uh, the cat, storage. So these are the neighbors where these will pass. And then we come to the, the couple, the 
the darji couple the tailor couple now, the man is older than the woman and this guy uh, who's in the middle is choking and there is a plate with a fish bone at the at the bottom but in the alcove there is a sewing machine and if you go even closer you will see that the sewing machine says singer company written on it and then you move further up uh, on the right you have the kurtagor and company signboard then above that you have uh, an indian man entertaining two british or foreign guests and they both have humpback now this is called the story of the humpback and the fish bone so those two also have grown humpbacks and that has nothing directly with this story uh, so this is the lower half uh, this is the middle half you know you go further close because you, i don't have a very sharp image uh, but the the sewing machine has singer sign written on it so it's it's obviously not happening in medieval uh, baghdad at all it's it's happening in late 19th century early 20th century and kolkata very much because chitpur road was the center of trade and activity and people from china to armenia to britain to afghanistan to the whole of india were milling around there so it's a very cosmopolitan place and remember the capital of british india at that point and uh, until 1905 was calcutta so and it was a major trading post what bombay is to us now was calcutta to at the turn of the century to the whole country and this is the top right you know you have a babuji or a server who's in a red uh, dress serving food the clock says half past two in the night of course if you look at the sky you know this is night and the babu is entertaining two european guests both of them seem to have some hunch backs what is more interesting is that pankha that you see that white um, thing that covers the 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 painting that is hanging on the wall and shivakumar art historian art shivakumar has identified that painting as a portrait of dwarkanath tagore which used to hang in the drawing room of abhinindranath who is the painter so there is obviously a self reference which is incorporated in the painting which is like an insider joke and through that painting you can actually identify that the painter has inserted himself in the painting like in a hitchcock film you would see hitchcock appearing in a cameo in one scene har film mein dikhta hai you know there are some artists uh, in the some filmmakers in bollywood also who kind of appear in one scene of their films just for the heck of it you know it becomes something like a signature and here the artist has actually inserted not only his experience of the world around him but actually him as part of the arabian night story and it is not directly related to the story but it's also become part of the story so it's like a piage it's like an onion you know it sort of opens layer by layer by layer so some information is required you also have to have a very keen eye so it's not that that you will get the message in one go like you would with an ibm logo right and meaning is often layered in a work of art there is something called text and subtext there is something called ambiguity you know like somebody was saying that anything depicted the artist has an empathy with it tum agar ek bhale murderer ka portrait banao it's very difficult to not have empathy with the depiction because you can't say ki ye to badmash kharab aadmi hai main isko kharab tarike se paint karu you can't do it if you choose to do a portrait of somebody who is very bad a wicked man you would still have to do it well and that is called empathy with anything that is depicted and which is so typical in the art of painting for instance or sculpture because you are not making a moral judgment at that point you know and hence ambiguity is always part of visual art so messages are not one to one and in short what it looks like in the first might be deceptive it can like here is a classic example rashid rana a contemporary pakistani artist this is a work called the red carpet and you walk into the room and it's quite a large work and you see it from a distance and this is what you get to see and you think oh it's a wonderful persian carpet and well then you realize that the carpet is actually not painting it's actually made of chota 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 photographs they're all constructed with little little, little photographs then you go close as you move close you realize that these photographs are all taken in slaughterhouses in and around lahore 
So all the blacks are actually animal carcasses and all the reds, blacks and whites, and the reds are actually blood and meat. So it is in a way, what looks like a beautiful carpet has something say something about violence and it's very graphic. And you only realize it when you go very close to, and this is a very simple example, but this is just to give you an idea, the tip of the iceberg, if you like, that images are not necessarily what they seem to be. When you look deeply, when you look carefully, uh, when you get into it, it might actually give you contradictory signals. That is ambiguity. Or it might actually tell you that what you saw first is wrong. And so that is what I'm saying, that the first reading can be misleading. So if anything, what I'm trying to say is that art is rich and layered and a continuous tapestry spanning many centuries. And it can be many things. It can be creatively exuberant as well as dark, visceral, critical. Mm, uh, it can be funny, lighthearted. It can be big. It can be small. It can be very well executed. It may not be all that well executed. But it can be pleasing to the eye or it can be challengingly provocative. So exactly opposites are possible and anything it is in between. So if you go with a box saying that this is art and this is not art, you will often find that you know you are not being able to enter the world of art. So the best thing is to, yeah, for every idea it's opposite exists. So the try, moment you try to define that this is art, you would see that 10 things will jump out and say, hey, what about me? If you say sculpture means volume, there will be Giacometti standing up and saying, hey, what about my works? They don't have volume. They're like stick figures. So isn't that sculpture? You say, no, oh, it has to be made with permanent material. There will be 10 different people showing you works that are not made with permanent material. So, you know, it's the moment you try to do that, very hard to define what is art. It defies description. And you have to understand that it's like an amoeba and many, many people have failed trying to define. So, so don't even go there. It's not necessary. Go there. It's an ever, ever expanding field, which incorporates many things, which was not there even 20 years ago. And that is how it will move. It cannot be fitted in a box, any box for that matter. So we'll have to go there with a little open mind and a sort of humbleness and curiosity. And of course, if you look, you will have a practice of looking and that helps. I think this is very important. Without that, nothing works. If you don't have curiosity and you don't have a sense of wonder, world of art is a closed box. Yep. So that is the presentation. Now, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. We oh, have 10, 12 very minutes. Nice. Very nice. You can unmute yourself if you have a question. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Yeah. I hope that made some sense. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Ishki. It was a very interesting session, actually, and um, I'm more intrigued to understand and study the history of, you know, art and after the session. In fact, my job is done. <laughs> like, if you can re recommend any books or any resources and that would be really oh yeah 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 there are many books there there is a bn goswami book about uh, look him up 
it is basically talking about 100 images from Indian history, mostly from the miniature tradition, but a variety of miniature traditions. And it's a wonderful book because each page talks about each work. And it's a big fat book, so don't get daunted by that. But it's a fun read because it's not meant for specialists. And he um, has got very deep knowledge about these works. But he talks about them uh, like telling stories. As for European art, uh, the Gombrich's book called The Story of Art. I think it is like a story. So if you, if you read it. For contemporary American art um, or and uh, European art, there is a book by Robert Hughes uh, called um, The Shock of the New. Um, you can read that. Anybody can read it. You know, it's not a sort of written in a uh, in the sort of art lingo anybody can understand you have to have a little patience and a little curiosity and try those books and you will see thank you yeah there are many books but um, um, story of art is a good good place to start and there is another book by john berger which i recommend uh, even if you don't want to read it, you can go to YouTube and there is a film which is which is what the book is based on. It was a series that he made for the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC. It's called Ways of Seeing. Um, if you if you can watch that, uh, even the video, I think you would, okay. you would get to know about you know things about perception, how things are perceived. But uh, if you read um, Gombrich. Uh, you get an overview of the development of particularly uh, the Western art, not so much about other cultures, but it gives you a foothold. And from there on, you can move. And Vian Goswami's book, I, I can't recall the name. I think I will, I can give you to later. Yeah, yeah. But that is also a very fantastic book. But that, that scope is only say about 300, 400 years. So it talks about mostly medieval and post-medieval um, painting traditions, uh, which are basically- Is it the spirit paper. of Indian painting? Spirit of Indian painting, yes, yes. Spirit of okay. Indian painting, yes. Okay. Right. Um, it's a big fat book. It's very daunting to look at, but it's a fun book. And you don't have to read everything in one go. You can just right. flip through it. You know, you, any image that takes your fancy, start reading about it. Yeah. So it, it doesn't have to be like front to back, I've finished everything. You don't have to do that. You know, you can just meander through it, pick and choose. Gombrich's history, on the other hand, is why I'm recommending it, because it talks a lot about the, and, and um, Robert Hughes's book, um, The Shock of the New, is because it, it connects history, society, politics, and to some extent economics with the production of art. So you realize that art is not Swayambhu, it's, it's not sort of disconnected. It has social functions, it is a product of a particular society and history. So that connection is made. You know, there are other books, I can talk about Janssen, for instance, which is a standard textbook for European art. But that will not give you that perspective that Gombrich gives you because the story of art is literally a story of art and you read it like a story of how things unfold, how things change from one to the other um, because of certain things that are happening in the society. And I think that is very important. Now, once you're done with these things, then other books can be recommended. These are the basic readings. I think you should uh, at least try one of them. And I think the first you should try watching the video um, Ways of Seeing uh, and read the Story of Art by Gombrich. G-O-M-B-R-I-C-H, Gombrich. Ernst Gombrich, right? Yes, yes. Thank you. Ways of seeing, shayad, hum dek chuke hai riyaz mein. Yeah, I'm sure it's a very basic thing, but book is also very good because sometimes video me kuch kuch cheeze miss ho jati hai. 
you can go back to the book and read it but if you don't have access to the book don't worry go there and see it again because i have yeah. seen it so many times in my life and every time i see it i discover new things for me so it's not a one le- one led thing you know the more you see you would more you discover you see that you go back to the works you see the works you come back to it again and you would see oh acha ye bhi tha wo bhi tha you know so that's the thing about a good book or a good painting or anything good that you go back to it repeatedly it's not like fast food it is something that you relish and you do enjoy over a period of time and you even enjoy the after taste it's not just maine ghapa ghap kha liya aur baad mein mere pet mein dukhne lage but jab main kha raha tha tab mujhe acha hi laga lot of fast food is like that so these are these are good things these are not fast food so you have to give it some time slow down yourself a bit our good art also does that it slows you down you know it's not something like a uh, you know that music video channel hai na usme ek minute mein 150 shots dikhate hain tumko tak 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 cut 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 you don't see anything but you just think that you know things are happening what is happening what kind of messages is giving is a very different ball game Uh, mtv 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 is famous for that that it sort of bombards you with images and images and images and something is happening constantly nothing is static you know even if you are hearing an interview the camera is constantly moving so you kind of grow into that your attention span shrinks uh, so in a way good art also helps you to slow down whether it's a good book whether it is good music whether it's a good painting you need to look at it spend time reflect you know it is not fast food it cannot be fast food not everything in life is fast food anyway so i wanted to ask one uh, question on uh, uh, your illustration experience and being an artist and an illustrator is there something yeah, yeah. that you would like no, no, to share no that is very interesting question actually and good that you asked it because i've see when i was in art college illustration was something which people looked down upon a little like it's if you can't really succeed as an artist you go there and i didn't believe that one bit because i kind of came to visuals through illustration and i was exposed to a lot of good illustration so my experience i thought you know that is that's rubbish illustrations do illust- something that you know artists don't do they they actually make reading such a pleasure and a good illustration is an illustration which stand on its own feet and it adds to the text you know just an illustration which says and ram enters the room and you see a man entering the room that's a dead end illustration a good illustration if you see a say a sukumar illustration or a lewis carroll book with a sir john tenniel illustrating or a variation of that by say ralph steadman everybody bring something of their own to the table and it is a work of art because it is something that even independent of the text functions and with the text what it does it creates a, a third text it is very difficult once you see in a good text with a good illustration to to only forget about because that helps you to expand your vision it's very difficult to to think of alice in wonderland without sir tenniel's illustrations why because you know they they add so much to the text and in 73 this welsh um illustrator did um, a version of alice in wonderland his name was ralph steadman you can go and look him up and it's a very different take on um, when he was a cartoonist his style was rather violent and he was you know imagining the rabbit for instance as a daily commuter well, why is he busy you know so he kind of came up with this raison d'etre or or the caterpillar on the toadstool was made to look like john lennon you know haze of smoke and stuff like that so those you may not get all the references it's not necessary but you can certainly see that he is coming from a slightly different place and he is bringing his time onto the table and also his manner of looking at things which is you kind know, of slightly more violent and slightly less victorian but at the same time because 
Tenniel's illustration and the text. And I always give this as an example. It is so intertwined and so, you know, mutually responsive and respectful to each other that they, they create a third text. And I think that is what the best illustrations do, that you cannot think of the text minus that. Mm -hmm. And I think as illustrators, we should aspire to that state. And once you arrive at that, I don't think there is basically any difference. The only difference is that you have something to guide you, um, whereas you don't have that. Also, the other thing about children's book illustration is that somewhere in the back of your mind, you'll have to be conscious of the kind of the age group that you're addressing it to. If it's for very young children, then of course, there are certain things you do that's for teenage children, early teenagers, then they prefer certain kinds of things. But you can play with that, you can mold it, you know, you, you have to have that little elbow room. Sometimes our publishers also don't allow you that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I don't work with too many people. I, I love working with people who are responsive and sensitive to that. I know, know that everybody doesn't have that luxury. Um, and I'm not a full-time illustrator, but I do in illustration things that I don't otherwise try out in my painting. So in a way, it is an escape for me, you know, that I, I get to do things that I wouldn't be doing in my painting. And I you love can, that. You can experiment in that. Yeah, I can, I can <clears throat> try out things which I am interested in doing, but which perhaps will not fit into my, my painting or the other thing that I do. So it's an area that is a sort of extension of myself and I always uh, go there. It's like a vacation for me. You know, nice. Go there and, nice. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, just another question. Is there anything that you talked about history of art and all of that? Is there anything, any reference on the history of illustration itself? Like, I mean, is that Something that illustration, unfortunately, is not documented in our country at all. I have a talk, but then, you know, whoever gives a talk will come from his linguistic background. You know, then yeah. I was, uh, I was lampooned when I was in Chennai by all my Tamil intellectual friends that you bombs think the history of India is the history of Bengal. Now, I don't <laughs> want to, I don't want to go there. But the thing is that Bengali, um, history of illustration is very rich, but unfortunately, I don't have equal amount of knowledge about, say, Malayali illustration or Tamil illustration uh, or Malayali yeah, yeah, illustration. Yeah. So to talk about Pan India will be very difficult. I can talk about the history of yeah. Bengal illustration. I have some uh, documents collected, but unfortunately, because of the many languages that uh, we have, which is a um, double-edged sword it has its advantages but it also cuts the other way that nobody has access to everything and our um, the the mechanism of illus, uh, translation has been very poor so we don't even know the kind of treasure that exists in other languages but i can speak for my language and uh, that has a very very rich history of illustration from late 19th century and we can talk about it someday mm. sure Thank you. I wanted to ask a question if you can hear me. Yes. Um, so I was curious to know how you understand um, text-based art because, because some of your works that are available online, they, yes. they have text printed text mm. on them not just yeah. metaphorically but quite literally how yes how yes you... yes yes well i think a text is also a visual right first you 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 see it to read it so um, and there was this whole bias in 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 modernism that anything that is outside you know that you reduce art to its very basic like the the um, abstract expression is dictated that paint is nothing but marks on a flat surface or paint on a flat surface. Now, that is a very reductive logic and we have gone that way and we've seen, you know, you end up having white on white canvases, then what? So you have to come back, right? And we are living in a world which is very multi-layered. So I don't see any harm in incorporating text and I love reading anyway. And I, I sometimes write down things in the old fashioned way. I write it by hand of something catchy that catches my eye or I think is very profound in my notebook when I'm reading. 
so that that has been collected over the years i have many cool things i don't sometimes i don't even know where the sources are usually i write it down but at one point i thought that i will have them as parallel text and instead of titling the work i will use these texts they are not necessarily talking directly about the work but it's a parallel text to see whether that allows the person to open his or her mind or it also gives an insight into the minds mindset from where i am coming you know it so it doesn't necessarily talk about the particular work then i thought that what about uh, if i incorporate them so the first thing i did and i'm still doing is rather than having a title which is outside the painting i'm including the title and finding ways in which i can do because then you have to think about typography what kind of type what kind of size where do you want it all those things come into play you know and so um i'm kind of trying to counter that that sort of modernist bias that you know anything that given out even a whiff of narration is a strict no no i don't think that is how it works human minds love stories and why not indicate or pique that interest a little bit there is absolutely no harm in it as far as i can see and i think often the text and the visual combine to make a third text as i was mentioning which applies mm -hmm. to good illustrations and it it can work with good paintings also so why not it was really interesting to uh, to see them from the window of illustration it just it 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 kind of made me look in a way that why not reduce the text a bit for a while and then use it as an image the text as image and then work with it and around it yeah but these are uh, these are um, already what i had i used uh, uh, the ones existing now if i continue to work in that direction i will certainly play more with it yeah, yeah thank you yeah. and all the text is not even you know meant for reading there are some pieces mm -hmm. that are often that you 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 kind of just flipping through it and then certain things just stand out certain things are almost camouflaged or hidden you mm. you really have to make an effort to read it now some people would do it some people won't bother they would just read it so it's interesting to watch how what it does to the image what words mm. do to the image and this is a game that is being played by many artists you know and this is started even before the beginning of conceptualism and that's another thing that we can talk about you know how conceptualism has fundamentally shifted the goal post of what you expect art to be um because first of all he discarded all art and said that making art can be perfunctory it's the idea that is supreme mm -hmm. and we just sort of come back a full circle now nobody says that making art is perfunctory or most people don't uh, all the sort of contemporary artists who can fall into that conceptual category but they do use text a lot for a variety of purposes it can be somebody can be an activist artist so text has a certain role to play somebody can be just using text for its poetic import somebody can be using text as a kind of texture um so or a sort of uh, one of the very basic structured way of drawing that is also there you know the way you write text Tarundeep was here, you know. He was he's quite a great calligrapher, and he, he focuses so much on the strokes and stuff. You yeah, know, yeah. He, they they look like drawings, even if I I don't read Gurmukhi, which he uses a lot, but they're beautiful. That is not difficult to see. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Shall we wrap up? Because I'm afraid I have to run for this other meeting.